Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode number 259. My name is Brando, and it looks like we might have a bit of breaking news on the podcast, which is fun to do because it's pre-recorded how do you break news but we've done that before this episode uh one we're going to introduce my my co-host you know from al.com he's been featured in spin magazine rolling stone uh he's just a good looking fellow with too many rock shirts not enough rock shirts i say uh matt wake what's going on buddy (laughs) brando great to be here man and thanks for that intro how are you doing i'm doing well you know it's it's i guess like i wanted to keep up it was maybe at the end of last year you were doing like one rock show a day for an entire month. Yeah, in the early days of the pandemic, just trying not to go uh, uh, like Red Rum, like The Shining with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> but uh, uh, today, psyched to talk with uh, Mr. Howie Huberman, man. I know. So yeah, you uh, you're as my co-host, you just introduced our special guest for today. Uh, How you may remember, he was on episode 115, and he was he came on with Billy Road to discuss the quote ground zero of Guns N' Roses. And, and back in the 80s, Howie, you, it, the store was what? Gu- uh, Guitars Are Us? That's what you... Uh, Guitars Are Us, I'm from, so correct. Beautiful. And you, you sold before they before they became anybody to Slash and Izzy and you worked with v- v- Vicky Hamilton in the early days of GNR and, and Poison. So I just kind of want to catch people up uh, about your story if they haven't heard that episode. Okay, uh, would you like me to do the catching up for these people? <laughs> sure. Is there anything else that I missed? Anything else about yeah, I, you that we should know? Uh, no, nah, you know, you want me to give a, a brief synopsis up until the uh, the GNR signing, and then we'll take it from there? Yeah, because Howie, I want to give people the teaser. He's the one that appraised the Izzy guitar that recently went up for auction, and Matt, with his journalistic hat, and his professionalism, he has written a couple articles about it for AL.com, and we're going to have an update on it, it sold and for how much. So I wanted Howie to come on to kind of give a history of the guitar, and yeah, and, and yourself, because you are such an interesting guy, and I've wanted to have you back on for a while, to be honest with you. So thank you for coming on before you say anything else. Thank you. No problem. I, I appreciate uh, what you do for rock and roll, for the uh for the Guns N' Roses saga and story and the continuation of uh, its longevity because we're here because of bands like Guns N' Roses. If it wasn't for those type of bands, we'd be in a different profession, I think. Yeah, I, it's because I, I have a, a doing this podcast, but when I've got to do classic rock radio and be in the studio blasting Guns N' Roses, otherwise I'm just editing audio or, or, think, or boring things. No, Guns N' Roses have made, has made... Uh, my life more interesting than it would be without it. So obviously that's an understatement for, for you. So yeah, what did uh, I know? I, again, I condensed your, your story, but what can uh, you share this time around about the legend of Howie Hubberman that we don't know? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead for people that have not caught uh, episode what, 159. What was that episode? I, I can't believe it. Cause there are people who actually, and I got the number wrong, so I need to repeat it because there are listeners who say they, They've told me they've listened to every episode more than once. I don't know why, but they do. So I thank them. Uh, episode Is one. that good? I guess so. Uh, episode 118. So we're on, what, no, episode uh, 259 now. So it's been a while. It's been a while. What so, took you so long to get me back out? I don't understand. I, I don't know. <laughs> people that haven't heard 118, basically, um, I think I was out with Billy Ralph from, yes. uh, from Jet Boy. Uh-huh who I'm friends with in the guitar building community. And also he recently joined a band that I'm friends with called Buck Cherry. Yeah, I know. And I wanted to say that Buck Cherry has an album going to be released on Round Hill Records. And if people in the music business don't know who Josh Bruce is, who owns Round Hill, you better find out because he's a major player, major, major player. So 
Right on. I'm a Buck Cherry fan. We've had Josh Todd on on the program, so I'm glad. I'm happy for Billy to be joining that yeah, outfit. He's loving it. He, he loves he loves playing with the band. The band's a great band. It's a fun band. It's a really? real rock True. band, which is cool. Anytime you have a real rock band these days, it's always cool. Right, Matt? Oh, definitely. And another kind of cool uh, GNR connection, or uh, not GNR, but kind of uh, that era of uh, Sunset Strip rock. Uh, so Billy, of course, from Jet Boy now with Buck Cherry. Jimmy Ashurst um, from Broken Homes and uh, later with Izzy Stradlin's Juju Hounds uh, yeah. played with Buck Cherry for a while. So um, uh, cool to see that. It's really impressive out here in L.A. As you know, you know, <laughs> it's a revolving door of ins and outs. It's um, all the, the – that's why I call the, the six degrees of a GNR bacon, I guess, just for this, this platform. So, yeah, you can make the connection to – anything that's that's go. that's kind of the, the whole point so um that it, it's is there any because i don't even know like when is your book coming out howie because or how do we or, you know, how do we get to the point I, where I, I do, you're appraising I do have, his guitar i do have it going on but i haven't even started it yet okay. um long story short is there are people that are probably going to wind up doing it and they ask me to be careful with what I put out before they finish or start the book or finish or start the movie. So it's long story short is I run everything through them. And so far they haven't said no to anything as far as podcasts or anything like that. They're fine with almost anything I can do. Um, it's, it's just a, a brief synopsis of what rock and roll has gone and touched me or vice versa and what's going on here. And, and as time goes on, I mean, I'm doing a lot of business right now with a lot of smooth jazz guys because I'm doing sound exchanges. I'm working with Josh Cruz. I'm working with Mark Ferrari. There's a lot of stuff that's going on that has nothing to do with real rock and roll. So when it, a chance and an opportunity comes with like a show like Brando's show, I love it because my roots are always going to be rock and roll. They're never going to be anything but rock and roll. Um, that's just how I was brought up. Um, as, uh, we'll do a brief synopsis of, uh, of episode 118, or 118 as, as Brando likes to call it. <laughs> uh, basically, we talked a little bit about what I did with Guns N' Roses back in the early days. I guess you guys called it Ground Zero, so we'll call it Ground Zero. What happened was, back in the day, um, I was doing a lot of shows and promoting stuff with a girl named Vicki Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And Vicki was working before the album came out with a band called Poison, mm -hmm. and they had just recorded Look What the Cat Dragged In, and they're on Enigma Records, and Enigma was willing to go 15000 all in, including recording, remixing, touring, and everything else, and that wasn't going to break a band back then. So for a very small amount of money, I bought the rights and the uh, project Poison from Vicky, and um, I started you know, in L.A. digging down deep and promoting uh, and financing and working it out so they became a bigger band than what they were. They were not big, but they did well at the Troubadour. Basically, I took them out of the Troubadour and I brought them to a place called the Country Club. So we went from like a 400-seater to a 1,000-seater. We start, started selling out multiple nights. We got Tom Wally from Capitol Records interested. He came down, and as he couldn't get in because it was sold out, I snuck outside, shook his hand. He didn't even come in yet. He said, Howie, give me a call. I want to sign Poison, and I want to do a deal with Enigma, and I want him on Capitol. And that was my, basically, heyday with Poison, getting him on a major label and getting the crowd to take him worldwide and, and do bigger and better things. But in the meantime, my commitment with Vicki Hamilton was to finance her next baby band, which turned out to be Guns N' Roses. So at that point, I was putting all the money, loaning guitars, amps, you know, doing deals so they could pay me off later on with Guns N' Roses, and that included Slash and Izzy, of course. Um, didn't have too much uh, interaction with Axel, although I did rent a apartment right next door to the Whiskey on Sunset for those guys, and Axel was one of the main guys that lived there. Okay. Um, long story short is they took it right up until the point where Jeff and Tom Zutat signed Guns N' Roses, and at that point they decided they wanted to leave Vicki Hamilton and uh, I think the first check from Geffen Records 
went to me. <laughs> so and there was a, a buyout to get them, you know, free and clear from me, which was okay. It was only a loan. Uh, I never really had participation other than alone with them. Mm. But in the meantime, I started, you know, giving them guitars and amps and things that I thought would make sense for them. Uh, Izzy came in, got a bunch of stuff. Slash got two real nice Max Les Pauls from me, uh, some amplifier heads, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And in the meantime, uh, the two guitars I guess we're going to talk about later on is a white 175 and a fusion guitar, a black fusion guitar by Gibson. And uh, both of those uh, came in and out of the store, and they wound up back at the store for a short period of time. They were bought by one gentleman who I don't even know. And recently, I think both of them sold at auction, correct, Matt? So, yeah, uh, Howie and uh, Brando. So uh, the black one was the one from the Paradise, uh, excuse me, Welcome to the Jungle video. The white one is the one from the famous Riff 88 MTV show. Now, I my understanding is the black one sold previous to the white one, and I'm not sure if it went to auction or, or not, but um, I can tell you that the auction for the uh, 87 white Gibson ES 175D uh, the white one from the Rich Show. It did sell. The starting bid for the guitar was fifty thousand. The hammer price, which is the price at which it sold for, plus the buyer's premium, ended up being just under eighty thousand, according to the co-owner of Backstage Auctions, uh, Kelly Van Gool. So it was the number I got was seventy nine, eight hundred and sixty bucks. Wow. So, okay. Um, you know, in general, I think the the last time I looked on Reverb dot com, like you could get an eighty seven ES one seventy five D for around three or four grand. So, uh, you know, Mister Stradlin and being in a, a classic video, the Ritz uh, performance, you know, obviously adds. That's a historical guitar. Um, so I'm curious, Howie, uh, the auction. Uh, company indicated that you did some, uh, like a notarized statement. And can you talk a little bit about this guitar, anything interesting about it, and just your involvement with checking it out? Yeah, please. Well, I wanted, wanted to make sure that that was the ES-175 that came back to me at Guitars R Us at the time. When uh, Izzy came back from the short tour, he did uh, the Ritz, and I think there were a couple other shows involved with it, too. It came back to me, and I think what it was is he owed me some money on some other stuff. So I, you know, I'm going to guess I gave him about $700 credit because back in the day in 87, 88, that's about what those were going for, about 700 bucks. So I gave him credit on that towards his bill. Um, he never had a really big bill with me, and, he, and Izzy always took care of it, you know, pretty, pretty promptly. Slash, on the other hand, um, he got some more expensive stuff for me, like the old Max guitars, and he wound up taking care of those eh, a year or two years later, but he did score up with me, and I did a, a youth quick show on USA Channel with uh, uh, Jennifer Smith, who later on won a, I think she won an Academy Award with, uh, with Wahlberg. They did a, a documentary together on concussions in the NFL, huh. but she was the host of Youthquake. And one of the shows she did was inside of Guitars R Us. I think it was in 92, maybe 93. And it was me and Slash together. Uh, it was the full half hour. It was me and Slash. And we're talking about the guitars he was using, why he uses certain guitars, the amplification, the good old days. And uh, we had a good time. It was a good show. Unfortunately, I don't think that show is available unless you pay for it uh, online. But it was a. Uh, it was called Youthquake. The host was Jennifer Smith or Jen Smith, and um, she was out of Texas at the time. And it's a cool show. It was about uh, guitar shopping with Slash, and it was me and Slash at the old Guitars R Us on Sunset. That that should so be a pretty, Netflix show. Now. I know, right? I mean, that, that sounds like a show I would want to watch now. Yeah, no, it, it it was pretty cool. Like I said, I went online to see if I could see it. And, it wasn't too much reference to that show. It was more reference to other stuff she did. But she did, uh, I think it was 200 and some odd shows or so, or maybe even more. 
And that's how she wound up meeting uh, Wahlberg originally. And then she became partners with him on that documentary that did really well for her. So she's an interesting, uh, again, like, like Brando, she's a great interviewer and uh, uh, pretty easy on the eyes, too, back in the day, as I remember. And uh, she was a good girl. I keep in touch with her a little bit through Facebook. We just like each other's posts and things like that. But uh, she's a good gal. She's a good person. She got married not too long ago. And um, I think she's still doing stuff, but I'm not sure. But okay. those episodes that she did, she did uh, one with me and CC DeVille from Poison. Um, she did a bunch of episodes. I think I was in either in the two or maybe even three episodes she did with Youthquake. But if you have a chance to see any of the old Youthquakes, it's very fast moving. It was uh, teenage orientated, and it was uh, giving them insight to the music industry and beyond. It was pretty cool. Right on. And that's what we're trying to do with you now, uh, Howie. And that's why at the beginning I wanted you to give the background for those who may not know why Howie was the guy to originally appraise this Izzy, you know, 87 Gibson and, and why he's the dude and, and how far back he goes. He knows guitars. He knows business. And like, did Izzy was, I, I don't want to get too, you can always say if I'm getting too personal, like, do you know if Izzy was aware that this uh, went to auction? Cause I think last time you said you were in contact with him. So I don't, you don't have to speak for him, but I'm just curious if he was aware at all. I'm more in contact with him through uh, someone that used to work for me and still kind of works for me, Tony Babylon. And uh, even like not long ago, um, he had a bunch of clothes from back in the day from 91 to 96, most of them being dress shirts and vests. Because Izzy was all about dress shirts and vests. In a in a cap, he always wore yeah. that kind of like a golfer's cap, almost right. Is yeah, that like a newsboy cap. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't get any of the golfer's cap, but I bought a lot of his dress shirts. Most of them were Prada, and some of his vests. I probably got about, I would say, thirty pieces. Hmm. I bought it all just to put it aside, just to have it, because hmm. I do dabble in uh, rock and roll memorabilia. Right on. Uh, I do appraisals for a lot of people, and the way that that guitar came to me actually through Billy because Billy knew, knew I had something to do with that guitar. And as soon as I looked at it, <laughs> there was a couple key marks on that guitar, which I won't even say what they are, but I knew that was the guitar and it came out of my store. It was only back at my shop for a short period of time. And, uh, one of the girls that used to hang out with guns and roses called a friend and said, Hey, if you want anything that guns and roses used to own, Howie at Guitars R Us has two guitars. And the guy came in, and that day he bought both those guitars. Smart. Fairly inexpensive. Wasn't, wasn't expensive back then. Um, I think the owners had visions of grandeur of getting a hundred to 200000 for those guitars, each one. Oh, okay. uh, but that's kind of what I thought they were worth. I kind of thought they'd go for between... Anyways, between fifty and a hundred thousand for those guitars. Very, very fair value on those guitars, actually. Whoever bought them did a good deal. He got a good deal. I mean, wow, okay. I, if I could have handled those myself and not in auction, I might have gotten more for those guitars. But then again, you never know. If they were looking for visions of grandeur, it could have gone as high as 150 Who knows? When you got two people that want it, that have the ways and means to New Orleans financially, then it could go for a lot of money. So, so that's and the they difference. went for a fair amount. They got, okay. It was a good deal. Whoever bought them got a good deal. So I guess... I mean, this might be the obvious statement that no two auctions could be the same. Like it could sell for this on one day and then that for on another day. Like what would be the difference, you know, or, or is it the auctioneer? Like you're, you're able to sell it more than somebody else. Like how does that I'm work? Not, yeah. I'm not super familiar with that auction house. I'm really familiar with uh, gotta have it rock and roll. I think that's out of New York, I believe. And I've had some stuff at auction. I've also appraised some stuff for them at auction. Um, so I'm not familiar with the, the place that. Uh, well, I mean, just in general, as, as like a premise in like of auctions. In general, if, yeah. if, if you advertise it enough and people know where to bid on it and how to bid on it, that's the key to it. There's been a lot of stuff. There's a place called Guernsey Auctions. There's Heritage. There's Bottoms. Um, a lot of people call me up before these auctions and they ask me to take a look at it for them and see what I think of, of the of the piece. 
uh, if they know me and uh, I usually do it for free. If not, I do charge for my appraisals. Um, I, I've been known to get a good amount of money depending on the value of a guitar. For example, there's a lot of guitars that are very valuable called Les Paul Sunbursts, 58, 59s, and 60s, and all the original 50s Carino Wood Gibsons, which would be Flying Vs and Explorers, because they, they're just very short supply. In fact, recently the Explorers of 58, Gibson Explorer, they've uh, they've tipped the, the scales at over a million dollars each. So unless you get a guy like me or someone qualified like me to look at these and tell you they're real Gibsons from the day and all the parts are right, and you're going to spend between two hundred and fifty and a million dollars plus on a guitar, you're probably making a huge mistake. And I've seen some huge mistakes made, and I won't mention any names, but there is an A-list guitar player that has paid stupid money more than once for a guitar that wasn't even made by Gibson. So okay. sharing that information with you. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a lot always of... a good thing to have someone in the know right. look at something before you buy it. So. Oh, 100%. Um, I'm not quite the collector you are, but I know in the community – there's, there's a huge Guns, Guns Roses collectors community, and yeah, it's all about authenticity. Otherwise, what's the, what's the point? You know, and I, and I love how you said you you knew the certain markings on it. And of course, you're not going to say it because people will try to recreate it. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, they, they can recreate it because now that one is going to be in a collection. Usually, when something like that goes to a collection, hopefully, there's only one. <laughs> right. <laughs> if they start becoming multiple, it's like this. It's like. Gibson produced, let's say, 1,600 Les Paul Sunburst guitars between uh, 58 and 60. And so far, they've only discovered 2,100 of them. Hmm. So either Gibson fudged on the amount they made, or some people are making some pretty good forgeries out there. Um, I know that a guy that I work with and I used to represent from 79 even to this day. Great guitar builder, great friend of mine. His name is Max. He lives in Connecticut now. And Max has made some great explorers, some great flying Vs, and some excellent Les Paul sunbursts. And some of them have passed the smelt test to collectors who put collections in uh, magazines, etc., etc. And when we see these, we... We laugh because, you know, Max does not make a guitar to deceive. He never does that. But uh, some of these have gone out and some of these have sold as real ones. Okay. Okay. I like that. So when when an artist like Izzy, because there could be so many reasons why somebody puts up something up for auction. And this was sold a while ago. So I, it's not like he's selling it. But when it's his guitar and, and an artist sees it go up for auction, I guess just try to, if we can put, try to put ourselves in his shoes or in, under the artist's shoes, like how do you feel that something that you once owned, now somebody else has and, and, and paid so much money for? Like, how do you think Izzy is looking at, you know, this sale right now? Or is he thinking like you? I, hey, think, I, I can I make think more Izzy's, money, you know? Yeah, man, you know, I think Izzy's cool with it. I mean, you know, Izzy, listen, Izzy's not hurting for money. <laughs> Izzy's a very talented cat. He's a very talented cat that knows what to do with his money. He knows how to go ahead and make sure the well never runs dry, and he gets his fair share of what he did and what he participated in from the early days up until right now. So Izzy probably is looking saying, yeah, you know, that's, that's probably what it should go for. You know, do I wish I had it back and to deal with it and resell it? Nah, he doesn't. You know what? Izzy doesn't care. He really doesn't care that much. He has a good life. He is a great guy, and I think he's uh, he's happy that you know the, the, the guitar like that's going to go into hopefully a collector's hands and the right hands. Now, there's another guitar that I was involved with back. Let's in the same camp. Let's let's talk about Slash's guitar. Mm -hmm. Slash's original Les Paul he got was for me. It was called lovingly the Hunter Burst. Steve Hunter guitar. The Steve Hunter guitar. Now, Steve Hunter used to work for me at Guitars Ross. I'm very close friends with Steve. I believe Steve moved to Spain. I think he's in Spain now. But he used to be in Prescott, Arizona for a long period of time. And 
I love Steve dearly. And that guitar was gotten from Max to Steve. Steve uh, actually traded it back to me at Guitars R Us. And I talked Slash into buying that guitar. That was really Slash's first Les Paul of notoriety. Wow. Now, unfortunately, Slash um, let it go out of his hands. It went to a certain area, and it was bought by a, a semi-collector back in, um, I don't know if it's Iowa or Indiana or whatever, but he asked me to verify that was the guitar, and it was. Recently, and by the way, I sold that to Slash for $600. Hmm. Recently, that guitar showed up in one of my partner's hands, uh, Albert Molinero, for the price of around 90 to 100 grand. <laughs> wow. It was offered to Slash. Okay. And Slash decided he didn't want it. Hmm. Within the last six months, it's kind of come up for sale again. And Slash had a chance to buy it again, and he still didn't buy it, but at least he considered it. I'm going to value that guitar at between one hundred and fifty and 200000 easily. Slash also has another Max guitar that I've named, and I sold it to him. I'll call it the Skull and Crossbones. And I sold that to Slash for 2600 And he paid me about a year and a half later after I gave him the guitar. Hmm. The Skull and Crossbones is still owned and uh, loved by uh, Slash. And I'm going to put a value on that guitar at between two hundred and three hundred thousand. Now remember, he bought that guitar for me for twenty six hundred dollars. <laughs> it's a great Max. It was better than the Hunter Burst as far as uh, specs go and everything else. More playable to me. Um, but both of them, you know, are really, really, really high profile guitars. They were made by Max and owned and played by Slash. In fact, the Hunter Burst, I believe, is on the cover of Reckless Road, okay. which Mark Cantor wrote that book, and it's all over the place. You can see in the early days, Slash used that as his main guitar for quite a while. Yeah, that's a, that's a great book. Absolutely. And uh, Mark's doing a great thing now with the, uh, the 51st gigs, where he's releasing a lot of the footage. of yeah. th those. I mean, it's just amazing how... I, Matt, didn't you say you were curious? Or you know what? This might have been a question. I, you know what? I want to give a credit to a listener. Okay, this is going out to Sean. See, I found it. I stalled it, uh, long enough. So, so Sean is asking if you, because you did invest uh, money in, into GNR and, and Poison, but did you really know at the time like what they would become? Or did you feel like you were just kind of selling instruments to regular people? I knew that Poison was going to make it. And I'll tell you why. Um, I put a lot of money into Poison. I saw what it did on the local level of Los Angeles, and it was only a matter of time before we thought about how to build it outside of Los Angeles and take it, taking it worldwide. When Tom Wally from Capitol re-upped the Poison deal and signed them in conjunction with Enigma, because they, ne they never really purchased it from Enigma, they partnered up with Enigma, I knew that eventually we could take the story across the world just like it was in Los Angeles. And I knew it would be successful. That band was a very hardworking band, by the way. Anybody that thinks that there's just too much fluff and poison and they don't understand it and how did, could they get so big? Well, you know what? It takes guys like myself, Vicki Hamilton, Tom Wally, Peter Paterno, and all these names are fairly famous names. And, and, and once they start believing in you and they know and they see the writing on the wall, usually, usually it happens. I've seen it fail sometimes, but usually it happens. And now let me go to the, the item of interest. Did I know that Guns N' Roses would be as big as they are? Um, no, no, no. But I knew they'd make it, hmm. and I knew they'd do great. They had excellent songs. They were real rock and roll. It was one of the first real rock and roll bands to come out of the glam scene and reinvent itself in Los Angeles. And when that happened, and I saw what they were building as far as a following, 
And there was not that much money in Guns N' Roses at first. We put a little bit into ads and things like that. We gave them the right equipment. We tried to get decent shows for them. We didn't really get them that many decent shows. All the shows they did, they kind of like headlined themselves. Um, they went, you know, from Fender's Ballroom, opening up for an act to, you know, the Country Club and, you know, they, of course, they did the Troubadour and the Whiskey and the Roxy. In fact, the Whiskey and the Roxy shows, the promoter was me. So it's like I'm sitting there putting money in, giving them money, letting them, you know, live on my, you know, giving them guitars, doing the show. And at the end of the night, if I broke even and we can count the money and the money we put into the advertisement and everything else, we considered it back at that time a success because, you know, we really wanted Guns N' Roses to succeed. We, 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 uh, oh, am I with you still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, we're just, I'm okay, listening. I'm another call from New York. <laughs> oh, are you getting weird. another okay. call? It's okay. I'll let this caller from New York, uh, I'll let it fester. Okay. Um, so but we really, important. really knew that it was going to go, but nobody knew how big it was going to be. It became at one time, in fact, maybe it still is, it's actually the biggest band out of the United States still. I don't think there's really, much competition. I mean, there's there's Kiss, there's Aerosmith. Um, I mean, what else is out there that's like a Guns N' Roses? Right. Yeah, Matt, what do you and say? I do believe. Uh, Matt, what do you say? Because he named it Van Halen, Kiss, you know, yeah, Aerosmith. Yeah. Well, there's no Van Halen anymore. So. <sighs> I mean, this this that ship sail, unfortunately. It's it's more of just like the historical, you know, not not like today necessarily, but like who is the biggest American band ever? Right. You know, and GNR well, that, is, is up there. I'll, yeah. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you one thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a strong opinion right now. Okay. And I know that you guys are huge Izzy fans. I believe that Izzy will eventually step back into Guns N' Roses if not for a short period of time maybe for a longer period of time I believe that Izzy as strong as Guns N' Roses is right now I believe that Izzy is very important to the longevity of Guns N' Roses and the cementing of Guns N' Roses being the biggest U.S. rock band of all time. And I believe that will happen in my lifetime. And by the way, I turned 66 in two weeks. Well, happy pre-birthday. It was just the anniversary of not in this lifetime. So hopefully, you know, that didn't I'll be down on my birthday. I'll be down in Panama City Beach, Florida, outside, where the big smooth jazz fest is called the Sea Breeze Fest with Mr. Norman Brown. And if you're a fan of great guitar players and great talents, you want to tune in and listen to Mr. Norman Brown, who at the time was going to hit the stage the 24th, headlining it. He'll have the number one song on Billboard on Smooth Jazz. It's already number 12 this week. Okay, okay. Sorry, Matt, I heard you trying to jump in uh, a couple times. What, what do you got, buddy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so um, I, I... I, I would love it if Disney returned to the fold. And, and of course, you know, if they're working on new uh, studio stuff, Izzy Stradlin in a songwriting mix is always a huge thing. The thing I wanted to ask you, uh, Howie, is, you know, it's real easy to identify for most people Slash's guitar, uh, Slash's guitar style. It's high in the mix. and People are very familiar with it. Izzy's known more as kind of a songwriter and kind of a vibe guy, but as a guy who is around him as a live guitar player, um, uh, what do you think was interesting or cool or just sort of the essence of Izzy as a guitar player, not the songwriter or the guy who was just the coolest guy in the room? Um, uh, because I, I'll be honest, when I saw Guns back with Izzy um, back on the Illusion tour, he was really low in the mix. It was almost all slash in the mix. So I'm thinking in the earlier days, he was probably higher in the mix for a live thing. What, what's, what was Izzy's thing on guitar for Guns N' Roses? Here's, here's the best way to describe it. I mean, I watched a lot of these songs develop, um, you know, besides being to a couple of rehearsals because they basically rehearsed 
right across the street from my store and back a guitar center where, where they have guitar center now. You could say this, and I'll sum it up, and maybe this will make sense to everyone. I think that Izzy and Slash were the yin to the yang of what they created, rock and roll. And uh, without Izzy and Izzy's parts, Slash would not have been as strong a guitar player. Izzy allowed with his playing and his writing slash to step right in and go ahead and make it stronger, better, bigger, more powerful than it came in with just, you know, so, you know, Izzy came in a lot of times with just some, you know, simple chord progressions and some ideas. Slash was more the lead guy and more, you know, putting in some extra stuff and, cementing it and, and believe me a lot of times i was really um in awe of slash because slash would come in with ideas and leads and every time he played it and they played out in the early days he hit the nail on the head almost every time he was out there it was amazing because uh, you know no one gave slash the credit that he deserved at first he was a guitar player uh, the credit that Slash got that he deserves kind of rose from his, I'm going to say from his commitment and Gibson's commitment to him as far as being a guitar hero, have his, his own models out, et cetera, et cetera. Remember, when I brought Slash's name into Gibson at first, they wouldn't even sell him a guitar at a discounted price. <laughs> No, wow. seriously. And now he's the biggest endorsee that Gibson has. Unreal. Unreal. That's unreal. See, Matt, that's why, and thank you for asking that question. That's why I have you on uh, today as my co-host. I would not have been able to ask that intelligent of a question to get that intelligent of an answer. So, uh, fascinating. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Howie, is there any way for, because obviously you're, we're, you're very friendly and you're always uh, you know eager to share share stories and and yes even advice even though you don't like to take that compliment uh is there a way for people to reach out to you if you or, or look at what your collection or things that you might have up for for auction or if they need something appraised um how can people reach out to you uh, there, there's two, let me let me give my email address i guess i don't want to give my phone number out I'm, okay email is great <laughs> as we're, as, by the way as we talked here i had calls coming in from four different states to give you an idea, including New York, and I thought I lost you, and you're calling me back, but I guess you didn't. Um, yeah, let me give my email address. It's real simple. It's my name, all small letters. So it's H-H-U-B-B, as in boy, boy, E-R-M-A-N. So again, H-H-U-B-B-E-R-M-A-N at AOL.com. Okay. I'm old school because I'm old. <laughs> okay. Um, you can also reach out on Facebook under Howie Huberman, uh, and I think I can get messages from anybody, but I've, I'm one of those idiots that have 5,000 friends already, and I refuse <laughs> to make another account because I don't need any more friends. Um, uh, I love it. Here's an interesting thing. On the other line, I've got an early guitar tech of Slashes on the other line who actually rents one of my houses from me. Ooh. Okay. Which is kind of weird, but uh, <laughs> I'm gonna let that ring through, and I won't mention any names. Andy Brower, <clears throat> uh, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I got to do something. I, I tell you, it's it's weird because I do a lot of podcasts and a lot of shows and a lot of, you know, I, I do some television too, and and I've got a girlfriend from the last six months, and she always complains because everyone talks about some of my other girls that I hang out with and stuff like that. And, you know, and they're, you know, you never mentioned me. Okay. So I'm just going to, for two seconds, can I say, uh, joy Nolder? Uh, I've been with her about six months now and she's a, a pleasure to be with. And I brought her into my world as far as, you know, some of the live stuff I do and things like that. And, and it's a blessing to be with a woman like that. She's very much behind me. And she knows that sometimes, like, I'm, I'm traveling for my birthday to do this smooth jazz situation in Panama City. She wanted to go with me, 
And I explained to her, it's really hard for her to go with me because I got so much on my hands to do there. And it's a first time client with Norman Brown because I just, you know, picked up management from Norman recently. So uh, I love her dearly. And uh, that's all I got to say about that one. Back to rock and roll. Okay, guys. <laughs> no, I love it. This is a perfect uh, segue too, because, uh, cause you said her name is joy, correct? Joy, J O Y. And yeah. she's a joy. So that's my fiance's middle name. And we were actually oh. just d- discussing, uh, cause I was, and this is all ties to everything. This is all so freaky. I ha I still have an AOL account. It's not my main one, but that's the one I buy, uh, like tickets with. So I verified the fact that I still have my Guns N' Roses tickets for this summer. If it happens, uh, it's supposed to be in August if they do play, uh, in New Jersey. And if they do play in Chicago, where my fiance is from, I will make I hope it happens. My first trip to uh, Wrigley Field for a Guns N' Roses concert. Let's let's hope that happens. So uh, I, I'm with you on AOL. I'm with you on the name Joy Howie. So, <laughs> so I wanted to I just wanted to say that. <laughs> another 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 quick shout out too. Uh, the vaccines that are going down for the uh, COVID nineteen. I'm a big 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 supporter of getting vaccinated. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to get vaccinated, please do. Because when we get it to 70% or more vaccinations across the United States, you're going to watch this COVID situation, the coronavirus disappear. And it needs to disappear. And it needs to disappear quick because, you know, you can do whatever you want to do for business, for work and everything else like that. But without social events and without socializing, um, not much fun working your ass off for money when you can't spend it and do things you want to do. Yeah. So let's get this. Uh, let's get the coronavirus behind us. Let's get vaccinated, everybody. Well, as we're recording this, I'm getting my first shot tomorrow night. Uh, I will very good. I will be wearing my Guns N' Roses face mask. Appetite for vaccination. So uh, I'm, <laughs> I am prepared. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm amazing, okay. Howie, uh, Matt. What do you have coming down the pike? Because thank you, you're gonna have to at least you're gonna have to make another update to the Izzy article when this uh, podcast comes out. Yeah, so uh, working for something on uh, something for Spin on uh, kind of musicians who get caught on the other side of band reunions, uh, people who are with the band at the current time that when they reunite with kind of the classic lineup, they're kind of out of a job. So think. Uh, there's lots of examples we can all think of there. So yeah, how uh, getting appropriate. some sources, getting some sources down for that. Um, I'm talking to uh, Artemis Pyle tomorrow from Leonard Skinner. Awesome. Uh, they're a classic era drummer. Uh, there's a 76 Nebworth live thing coming out, uh, on Skinner. Um, and, uh, so a question that I wanted to sneak in here please, to Mr. Howie, uh, there are two really quick. Um, so one is I I've read that you've, uh, sold a lot of guitars to Rick Nielsen from cheap trick. And we all know, like we talked about the GNR and the poison guitars. Uh, and I think warrant is another band too. Who are a few other famous guitar players that you have sold to a lot over the years? And second of that, I read, uh, at one point, you were kind of connected to a film that was maybe headed towards development or something. Uh, James Franco was going to try to do something with Reckless Road. Um, he, so, he was my partner on that, yes. What, whatever happened with that, is it totally dead? So the, the update on the Reckless Road movie and then also uh, maybe any kind, of, uh, any kind of other interesting famous guitar uh, players that you've sold to any kind of cool fun story there. Okay, I'll give you a couple of cool stories from the Guitars R Us one, uh, and then I'll I'll talk about the Guns N' Roses movie, The Reckless Road, real quick because a lot of people don't understand what what happened with that. But I, and I'm going to clarify it for everyone. Let's start out with a couple famous uh, people. Guitars R Us. One day we got a guy walking through the door. The boss. The boss wants to know if we got any J200 Gibson guitars. We take them into the back room. Strength thing. We show them a 1959 blonde J200 near mint. He wants to buy it. Of course, we've got a shelter in the back room where we keep the cases. The guy comes in the back, looks at Bruce, 
looks him right in the eye and goes, you know, did anybody ever tell you you look a lot like Bruce Springsteen, except you're a lot bigger than him? <laughs> Bruce looks at the guy and goes, yeah, I'm told that a lot, but, uh, you know, Bruce is a little pipsqueak, he goes. We go up to the front counter, and the front counter back in that day was a huge 10-foot Fender Baseman 212 speaker bottom, resembling it to the T. That's where we used to do all our deals. As Bruce is cutting a check, and the, I can tell you the exact price of the guitar was $3,000 back then, and on top of the checkbook, of course it said Bruce Springsteen, and the guy that made the comment is looking at the name as he's signing the check, he turns all white and walks out the door. Comes back about 15 minutes later saying how, you know, how embarrassed he is that he went up to him and didn't realize it was Bruce Springsteen. And I go, hey, it happens all the time, all the time. No big deal. Next one is a personal thing because it involves my father. My father was a huge sports nut. He even liked watching tennis. And back in the day, as he was getting older and had nothing more to do than watch sports on television, and by the way, my father is left-handed. As many of my friends are left-handed now, which is weird, and my, uh, my nephew is left-handed. He, my nephew is a great drummer and a great guitar player, too. He's left-handed. So you'll love this story. I'm sitting at that same desk, and who walks in the door but Chrissy Hine mm-hmm. from The Pretenders. And she's got in tow a very famous left-hand sports figure. Who would that be, guys? Would you want to take a guess on that? Very famous left-handed mm. sports figure. Associated with Chris uh, Hyde at the time. John McEnroe. Very good. Ooh, John McEnroe. Well so John McEnroe comes in and Chrissy Hine bought him a left-handed Telecaster. Hmm. Because Chrissy, you know, plays Telecasters a lot. She's got that silver gray Telecaster and some other good stuff. So as he's buying the guitar from me, and she's actually buying it for him, I look and I said, John, can you do me a favor? My dad's left-handed. Can you write something out to my dad? And he wrote out on a piece of paper I had there, from one lefty to another. Hmm. It made my dad's year believe me when i when i showed it to him he couldn't even believe he couldn't even believe and by the way i I, you know back then we didn't take pictures that much i didn't you know i didn't need a picture i just needed to know the story i needed to know i was there for it so that was pretty interesting um another interesting story too and you guys are from new york so you'll like this one and you'll like it a lot when i was when i was managing poison i did a tv show MTV out of New York with a little girl named, come on guys, back in 86, who was, who was the girl? On MTV? Martha Quinn. Martha, yeah. Bingo. I'm sitting there at my desk and a little girl walks in and this is four months after I appeared with Poison on MTV and on her show. Four months. Now, let me tell you guys, I'm a nut when it comes to working out and doing exercise and losing weight. When I got off the road with poison, I weighed 240 pounds. I oh. got down to 140 pounds <laughs> in three months. Wow. Okay. And I did it health, healthy wise. In other words, push ups, sit ups, eating the right stuff. When she's sitting there and I'm looking at her, I go, wow, did they ever tell you you look like a lot like Martha Quinn? And she looked at me and she goes, oh, really? Have you met Martha? And I said, yeah, I was just with her like four months ago. And as soon as I said that, she looks at me and she goes, Howie Hoverman? <laughs> I go, yeah. She goes, well, weren't you like heavy? I go, yeah, not anymore. And uh, I actually took her out that weekend to a club called the Spice Club Ooh. to go see Billy Idol and Sam Kinison. It's a lot of fun. Back then, it was probably 87 yeah, it had to be like eight, like like the beginning of eighty seven. She uh she wound up uh marrying a guy named uh Jordan who she was buying a guitar for. He was with a band called the Fuzz Tones. Do you remember the Fuzz Tones? I do not. I don't. Yeah, they were kind of like a popular kind of punky band out of L.A. 
and um, she's got a couple kids with him, and they they live in Malibu. Uh, I think she does some TV, but not a lot. But th- to me, that was interesting that uh, she didn't recognize me, and she called my bluff to see if I met her. <laughs> and now that I meet her, but she didn't recognize who the hell I was. <laughs> so well, she's funny. also on my uh, my wait my wish list. I would love to have her on the podcast uh, as well. You know, uh, like you, she's okay. obviously. I can't imagine the amount of stories that she has. Crazy. Okay. So that takes care of some of my famous people stories. By the way, hmm. our clientele over the last 30 or 40 years includes well over 700 celebrities, including actors, actresses, sportscasters, killers. <laughs> um, and you probably know the ones that I've associated with, some of them. Uh, it's funny because, you know, when you're high profile on Sunset, you meet almost everyone and anyone. And sometimes you keep a relationship going and sometimes you never want to see that person again for one reason or another, or they don't want to, you know, ever run into you. Who knows? I'm actually not it's familiar life. with the, uh, the murderers that you, uh, <laughs> uh, I used to, I used to play cards a lot with, um, a, a, a guy that used to be, used to play a thing called Beretta. Okay. Sure. Robert Blake. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> one of my, one of my, one of my girlfriends wound up marrying a guy that died recently named Phil Spector. Okay. Wow. And, um, the guy that wrote the book busted who wore the wire in Las Vegas that put, uh, uh, OJ Simpson in jail for a while. His name is Tom Ruscio. He's also, a collector of memorabilia. I'm very close friends with him. So yeah, these are people I pretty much met them all through my shop. All these people. Wow. So now what was the next question? We took care of celebrities. And what was the next <laughs> part B? Yeah. 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 The, the state of the James Franco reckless road, whatever. Happened okay. To uh, uh, this and is I the exact to story. Right. Okay. You, you got another 10 minutes. Sure, but Matt, you were hey, gonna you were gonna ask a follow a follow up to that. You said you were gonna slide something in there. The, the one other thing uh, that uh, that white uh, eighty seven Gibson ES one seventy five that just sold at auction. They were trying. They were part of the description was that it was used some on appetite. Um, there's you know some people you know it it could have happened on overdubs perhaps. To your knowledge, or do you believe that uh, guitar was used on Appetite for Destruction at all? Because it was made, and or I guess after basic tracking, but it the, that date fell before a lot of the overdubs. Is my understanding? Uh, do you have any knowledge if it did appear on Appetite at all? I'd be lying to you to tell you I have any knowledge of that at all. I don't. I just know that that was the guitar that he used on a lot of the live shows, including the, the rich shows, uh, out yeah. of New York. Uh, okay. so that, yeah, that, that's, that's a mystery to me. And I, I, I would never put my name on something unless I knew for the fact that it did go down. Okay. Now here's my guns and roses movie story with James Franco. It's quick, it's easy yeah. and you'll, you'll understand it totally. I got approached by, uh, Vince Jovet and James Franco. They wanted to know if I would be interested in spearheading a movie about Guns N' Roses and how would I go about doing it. I said, a good friend of mine wrote an amazing book about the early days of Guns N' Roses, and he runs a delicatessen on Fairfax. His name is Mark Canner. He's a great guy. And I'll bet you the best way to go about doing it is to go ahead and option the book for a movie. At the time, James Franco and Vince Chauvet had a movie-making company called Rabbit Bandini. And they were on their 30th film without having a real theatrical release yet. Um, They had guys in it like Demi Lovato. They had Brian Cranston. Mm. They even had uh, Robert De Niro in one of them, one of the films they were making. So they were, you know, the, the average budget of their film was probably about a million dollars was the average budget, which is a small budget. Um, the only film they did, and they actually didn't even complete it. They had to partner up with Seth 
uh, Rogan to complete it, was called uh, The Disaster Artist. Yeah. And it was all about the making of the room. Of a, of the room. a movie called The Room, right, right, which was a great movie. The Room was a great movie. It was very, very cult movie. And the movie Disaster Artist was great. In fact, James Franco did win, uh, I think, the Golden Globe for it, correct? That I don't recall. But it was a time where he was getting that Me Too movement accusations and fingers pointed towards him. So he didn't really fare very well at the Academy Awards on that one. So basically they came to me. We optioned the rights to do Reckless Road. We started talking about rewrites, casting, you know, getting, you know, a screenplay done. And we started doing it. We were about eight months in. What year I was get this? A phone call. What year was this? I get a phone call from a guy named James Keach. Okay. Does anybody know the name James Keach? James Keach won a couple Academy Awards, and he had the biggest biotopic of all time called Walk the Line about Johnny Cash. Okay. So he called me up and said, you know, I'm friends with Julian Raymond. We're doing the, uh, the Glenn Campbell story, and we're doing the Glenn Campbell documentary. I'm very interested in talking to you and James about getting the money together. That'll be no problem for me and doing this reckless road movie. I really want to get involved. So I called James Franco up, Vince Jovat, and I said, Vince, I know that James Franco is on Broadway doing the, the play of Mice and Men. James Keach, and I told him who James Keach was, by the way, James Keach had a very, very famous television show he was a producer of called Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, and he married the star of that, Miss, uh, Miss Jane Seymour, okay. who I'm friends with now, ironically, and well, now Dr. they're Quinn divorced. Medicine Woman, okay. Yeah, that, there was a big show for a while, big, big. Back in my day, not your days, my day. I'll, I'll just okay. never forget, so, just a quick side story, when I, I, I worked at Sirius XM for like a year, uh, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing important. I was like a board op for the Catholic Channel, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whatever I had to do. Uh, but there were celebrities there all the time. It's still Sirius XM, and I walk in, and uh, there's Dane Seymour, and I'm like early twenties, and at the time she's like what early sixties, still like one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. I like I froze. I rarely freeze, but I was like, and she looked at me and smiled. I was like, anyway, this still was obviously stuck stuck with me all these years. I just wanted to get out her, the pointless story. Her so. son, <laughs> her son, and Robin Zander's son had a band together that I put together four shows local in LA as a favor to Julian Raymond out of Big Machine in Nashville. And she came out to one of the shows and hung out with me. She is gorgeous. Yeah. She is gorgeous. Good for her. So anyway, just wanted to throw that in. <laughs> um, so back to what happened is, uh, J James Keach said, I'd like to get tickets to that show. And after the show, I'd like to talk to, um, I'd like to talk to James Franco about doing reckless road. And I'm sure we can come to an agreement on how we're going to go about doing it and get it on the fast track. And I said, I'm all for it. Let's do it. Well, James Franco couldn't be bothered getting together with him. Didn't even leave him a ticket at the door, I don't believe. I'm sure he got himself in because when you are have an Academy Award and stuff like that, you figure out a way to do it. Fast forward to about four months later, James Franco goes to a Guns N' Roses show, or should I say an Axl Rose show back then because it was pre-Guns N' Roses getting back together. Mm. And... He didn't have any tickets left at the door for him from Axel, and Axel didn't want to particularly meet with him. So, touche. Same thing happened to him that happened to James Keach, and all of a sudden, from that show, not getting in and not getting audience from Axel Rose, James decides he doesn't want to do the movie. Well, I got news for you. That would have been the biggest movie as a producer he would have ever done in his career. 100%. I guarantee it. 100%. I guarantee it. Because we would have all made sure that that movie never failed and that story still has to be told the correct way and the audience it has 
is huge just from what's going on right now with the reunion tour. Going to continue, continue, continue. And after they add Izzy, it'll continue and continue and continue. And the movie will get made, but it won't be by James Franco. And it probably won't be by me anymore. But someone will carry the torch and they'll finish the story of Guns N' Roses properly, I'm sure. Well, I I love your outlook, man. Uh, Wow, I've never felt this positive about the future of Guns N' Roses after an interview. I don't know about you, Matt. (laughs) How he's making me feel like that. He's like, you know, he believes Izzy's going to return. The, uh, the Obviously, the Reckless Road movie with a Guns N' Roses movie, something we've been wanting for years, you know, and there's so many that get it right, you know, the Queen movie, The Doors, and there are ones that get it wrong, like the the David, I haven't seen it, but the, the new one with David Bowie just got uh, skewered in the media because it wasn't approved by the estate, didn't use any of the music, so it's got to be done right. So if... James Franco's yeah, heart I, wasn't I, in I it. Heard that it. I heard that it's not done right, by the way. So Okay. Fair enough. Who knows? Who uh, knows? Well, and Reckless Reckless Road would be the great period to do a Guns N' Roses book too, when you know, young and dangerous and coming up like that. And um, Mark Cantor's book is so fantastic. And hey, yes, Brando, Howie, I will take an Izzy returning to G and R. That's going to get me through the rest of the week, man. <laughs> that prediction. So it'll it'll happen, even though both sides of it say it might not happen. It will happen. Watch. Okay. Hey, one more thing to share, guys, because you know the biggest band that I ever was associated with, just as being, you know, with a meeting in on or whatever. And I, I just got to share this with you. When I grew up, my sister who was three years older than me pretty much introduced me to rock and roll, but her favorite band, as many people have this as a favorite band, is the Beatles, of course. Mm. Um, I had more than one audience with Paul McCartney for one reason or the other. He was very cold towards me. I actually, at one point, did him a favor, looked at a guitar for him, and I knew it was his guitar because it was left-handed, and I gave him a free appraisal, and it was through a friend of mine, Brian, who now, for the last 15 years, has been playing... Uh, bass and guitar for him. Um, he's the blind haired guy on stage left, by the way, uh, or should I say stage right to some of you people. Anyways, um, the traveling Wilburys, cause I was friends with Tom Petty and all the other guys in that band, uh, all used to come into the shop, but the one traveling Wilbury that I wanted to meet the most was George Harrison. And I was very fortunate. We got a call during the day, during the traveling Wilbury time, from Tom, you know, and uh, also Al Cooper. Al Cooper was a, a pretty famous producer. He produced a lot of Leonard Skinner stuff. He was there on stage a lot with uh, Jimi Hendrix at the beginning. He was actually a roadie for Jimi Hendrix for a while. And he actually played in Blood, Sweat, and Tears. He was a great keyboard player and okay guitar player and a really good guy. Al Cooper's a great guy, a really nice guy. Um, we closed down the store to let Mr. George Harrison in. And my partner at the time froze up. <laughs> so it was all up to me. And George wanted to see some of the guitars on the wall. And he asked me questions about guitars that basically he made famous, <laughs> like the Coral Sitar, like wow. a Rosewood Telly, like a Gretsch single cut with the DeArmonds on it. And he asked me certain questions about it. And I gave him the right answers. I, I'm, I'm knowledgeable about finished guitars for sure. <laughs> but the fact is that he made these famous and I was asking questions from him. And incidentally, from 1970 to today, I've never met in my lifetime a bigger celebrity that was more heartwarming to talk to than George Harrison. That's nice. To and hear. I'm not the only one that says that he was a great, great guy, very friendly, very appreciative, very knowledgeable. And just, you know, you wouldn't think that of a guy that had, you know, was in the biggest band. There'll never be a, a bigger band than the Beatles guys. Let's I, face it. I agree. 
Yeah. No, I, 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 but the fact yeah. is, he was just a regular guy. Nice guy. Knowledgeable. Appreciative. You know, so that's my, you know, the, the biggest celebrity I ever met at Guitars R Us, George Harrison. Right on. And those those uh, adjectives could be uh, used to describe you, Howie. Appreciative, of nice, kind, all of that. Yeah. Oh wow! And just uh, just think about it. That's like being uh, asked by God, like how the weather works. You know, <laughs> George Harrison asking, <answered. laughs> like it's yeah. crazy, yeah. unbelievable. And 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 uh, and Matt, anything else? Any other good questions? Because I, I I forgot about the uh, the James Franco uh, project. Or yeah, you know, believe me, I really wanted to do it too because I, I, By the way. And this, this is going to seem funny to you guys, maybe, maybe not. As much good and bad that goes down about talk about Guns N' Roses, the presentation of that movie was going to be Guns N' Roses in the absolute best of light because I've never seen Guns N' Roses in anything less than the best of light. There was never a downside. Mm. The money that was gotten from me was paid back in full. The appreciativeness in them giving not only me platinum and gold records, but also Guitars R Us platinum and gold records. Um, and to this day, I mean, you know, I, I ran into Izzy quite a while ago. It was on Sunset at a, a guitar shop called Sam Ash. Sure. As he's walking in the door, I'm walking out the door. I don't recognize him at first. He recognizes me and gives me a big hug. And so, like I said, Anything to do Guns N' Roses wise, even Steven Antler, I've got nothing but good stuff to say and nothing in the best of light. So it's just weird that the movie never got made. And someone's going to make that movie. It's going to be a huge success. I hope they do it properly. And uh, I'll be looking forward to buying tickets for the movie theater. Amazing. And that's obviously well down the road. We'll do a, like a whole review about the Guns N' Roses movie in the future. We'll have you on Howie to talk about how accurate it is, but I'm thinking well into the future. But as of right now, this was awesome. Howie, thank you so much for coming back. It won't be two years until I have you back on again. And, and Matt, thank you again for your, your constant contributions to this podcast. Uh, Brando, anytime. It's, it's always a pleasure. And Matt, it's, it's great meeting you, too. We'll probably, now, Matt, are you from New York or are you from L.A.? You know, I'm actually from Maryland originally. I'm based in Alabama in Huntsville, near Muscle Shoals, where the NASA thing is. But, yeah, I used to write for L.A. Weekly for a few years, so I uh, know some of your history through doing some stories there. I did a story on Slash's Chris Derrick Appetite for Instruction Guitar for L.A. Weekly, um, but, uh, yeah, so I get to telecommute, but I'm also a staff writer for, uh, the three big Alabama papers, the Birmingham news, the mobile press register and the Huntsville times. So, um, but thank you, Howie, for your contributions to like these bands that I love, like helping get GNR off the ground, poison off the ground, your involvement with slashes guitars, you know, that, um, are pivotal in the role of the band, um, uh, we all know the stars of these bands, but uh, people like you, man, the real fans know you and know your part in the story. And thank you for that. Well said. No, thank you guys. Anytime I can carry the torch for rock and roll and I carry two torches, one in both hands. <laughs> and it takes guys like you that have podcasts, programming that write, that are journalists to go ahead and light those torches, make sure the torches never go out because our kids and our kids' kids will forget about rock and roll. And that's a big part of our life is rock and roll. And if we let people forget, then they're going to forget a part of our history. And that, as far as I'm concerned, will never happen. Right on. Thanks so much, guys. Well, you guys have a good day. And I will catch you guys uh, in Alabama, New York, <laughs> Palm, uh, Palm Beach. Anywhere we go, we're there. Right on. <laughs> okay. So that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. Thanks again to Matt Wake. Be sure to follow him on Twitter at Matthew B. Wake. If you like this podcast, you'd like following him on, on Twitter, rock and roll, Guns N' Roses stuff. So nothing to, to lose there. And speaking of Twitter, thanks to those who uh, continue the conversation in between podcasts, in between uh, by following on, on Twitter at the AFD show. So thanks again to listener Sean at Smark2400 for asking that great question uh, to Howie. And uh, a shout out when I announced this 
this guest. I want to make sure I acknowledge all of you, you know, even if you don't ask a specific question, but just participate in social media to to cess eight. Yes, I know my Roman numerals C E S S X I I I. <laughs> reading these Twitter handles are so funny right now. But he, uh, when I announced Howie, he's like, he also fronted money to Vicki Hamilton in order to fund some money of the early guns endeavors, if I'm not mistaken. And you're not mistaken. So you're a very intelligent audience. So uh, so thank you again. I uh, love Howie. So hit him up on his AOL account <laughs> if you have a question. And speaking of emails, you can always email me at the AFD show at gmail.com. As far as upcoming guests, I will tell you this because it involves you again. Many of you have requested Ginger Wildheart, and it looks like he will be coming up on the podcast. So I'm looking forward to that. And you are going to be involved, specifically uh, a buddy named or a listener named. He'll be buddy soon. Uh, Eric P at doesn't really matter. I like that. Uh, he was one of the ones that suggested Ginger. And I'm like, you know what? This seems like a good opportunity to have you as my co-host. And Eric was down to do it. And Ginger is down to have uh, a listener as a co-host. So look forward to that. Yeah. So just like that. Like, what are the podcast does it? Has this. Gets, asks the direct questions and also gets you directly involved in these interviews. So I want you to think about this as we continue to play our six degrees of GNR Bacon. Is there a celebrity or a person that you've always wanted to talk to and you just never had the platform to do it? Well, if they have a connection to Guns N' Roses, no matter how slight, get them on this show and you can interview with me. How does that sound? I think that's a good idea. All right. So what is to come on the podcast? I have no idea. In the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, you'll see it. I don't know. As soon as the word. <laughs>